Good morning. It's Teresa. We're in Texas on a very windy October morning. You're probably going to hear the wind. You're probably going to hear wind chimes. You will probably see butterflies behind me because my butterfly garden is right behind me here. They're always fun to see. Last week, we were in Acts chapter 3, the first part. Today, we're going to do the second part. And last week, we found out that Peter had and John had been walking into the temple, and there was a, a man that had been lame, couldn't walk from birth, and he healed him through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is like an umbrella. When you ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit is inside of you, outside of you, around you, and you're covered. Just like an umbrella keeps you from getting rained on, the Holy Spirit protects you, provides for you, gives you counsel. And before Peter had the Holy Spirit come inside of him, he did a bunch of really silly things, and he made a bunch of mistakes. But now he's been empowered by the Holy Spirit to speak the Word of God. Jesus did not heal this man lame from birth, though I'm sure he came across him many times when he was going in and out of the temple because this man's family placed him every morning right there in front of the gate of the temple so that when people came in and out, they would see him, they would have money in their hand that they would be giving to the temple, and he would have more of a chance of getting a donation to help him live. People who were blind or lame and could not work, they trusted on the hearts of other people being generous and open to help them. It's part of what the church is supposed to do. And when Peter and John walked in that day, the Holy Spirit moved in Peter's heart and told him to speak to the man. And he said, look at us. And the man looked at him and the man thought he was going to get money. But Peter gave him something far greater than just money to put bread on his table that day. He gave him the ability to walk again. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. He empowers us to do things that we couldn't do otherwise. So the first half of chapter three was this blind man being healed and all the people that were worshiping in the temple heard the commotion because the people standing around that saw the man being healed, they had been seeing this man for 40 years sitting beside the gate beautiful. And now this man was healed. And some of them actually saw Peter pull him up to his feet and then he started dancing and and running around and shouting praises to God and staying real close to Peter and John and the people were looking at Peter and John like they were miracle workers. Peter set some straight in this second half. Peter saw his opportunity and addressed the crowd. Remember he had addressed the crowd that had been drawn to the sound of the rushing wind when the Holy Spirit descended on the disciples. And now there was a miracle, a sign, something that people couldn't explain. And just like when people are drawn to a wreck, people were being drawn to this miracle of this lame man being able to walk. It's a pretty amazing thing. I've seen people get up out of wheelchairs and walk before. I have been witnessed to miracles before. A man pulled out of a burning fire that nobody else could deliver him. He was pulled out by angels. I believe in miracles. I do, because I've seen them. So people were coming, and Peter saw this opportunity to witness to the resurrection power of Jesus. It was the resurrection power of Jesus that had raised this man up from his lameness. And Peter wanted to tell them all about it again. What's so surprising about this, Peter said. And why are you staring at us as though we had made this man walk by our own power or godliness? That's what happens when people are being used by God and anointed by God through the Holy Spirit to do 
miraculous things, and then they start thinking that they did it themselves, and they get all puffed up. Before Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, he was puffed up in his own ability when he told Jesus, Oh, everybody else might run away, but I won't. I'll die with you. And Jesus looked at him and said, Peter, before this night is over, you're going to deny me three times. Peter also grabbed a sword and chopped off the ear of the servant of the high priest when they came to arrest Jesus. Jesus put the ear back on and said, Peter, people who live by the sword die by the sword. So it wasn't by Peter's physical strength that was going to keep Jesus from going anyway. When Jesus first tried to tell Peter that he was going to be crucified, Peter said, oh no, we're not going to let that happen to you. And Jesus said to him, get thee behind me, Satan. I must be about my father's work. I have to do what he tells me to do. It is when the enemy comes inside of us that we get distracted from the truth of God. That's why we're supposed to keep our minds focused on him all the time, pray unceasingly, not just three times a day like the legalistic Jews had done, following oral tradition. It's not an oral tradition that we follow. It's the voice of the Holy Spirit inside. So Peter did not want them thinking it was by his power that he had healed them. For it is the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of all our ancestors who has brought glory to his servant Jesus by doing this. Remember when athletes are trained by their trainers and then the athletes do well, it brings glory to the trainers. Jesus had trained these disciples up. Looks like somebody's trying to get our attention over here. The Holy Spirit tries to get our attention also. He speaks in a small, soft voice inside of us to get our attention when we're going down the wrong path or we're doing the wrong thing. Peter was allowing the Holy Spirit to speak through him that day to remind the people it brings glory to Jesus, our teacher, when we do the right thing. And Peter did the right thing at the right time because the Holy Spirit prompted him to get this man's attention and heal him. Then she just said, but this is the same Jesus I'm talking about that you handed over and rejected before Pilate, despite Pilate's decision to release him. Remember, three different times Pilate had tried to tell the people, <clears throat> the Sadducees and the Pharisees, that wanted Jesus taken out because he was telling them the traditions they were teaching the people were the ones that they had determined in the Talmud from the oral traditions that had been spoken by the grandfathers and the prophets explaining what the commandments of God were about. The people had replaced their opinion for the Word of God. So Jesus, being the Word of God, full of the Holy Spirit, came to correct them. Proverbs says you cannot correct a rebellious person, and you can't. They will not listen to you. They are so bent on what they think they need to do, just like these people were bent on getting Jesus killed. And there, remember there was a tradition at Passover that the Romans would release one of the people they had arrested during the year as an act of good faith to try to get the Jewish people to surrender more to their rule over them. And so Pilate had tried to get them to let him release Jesus. And the Sadducees and the Pharisees had been working the crowds when Pilate had taken Jesus in to question him more about who he was. Pilate was convinced he was the son of God. He did not need to be crucified. He had done nothing wrong. He was innocent. But when that was happening, the Sadducees and Pharisees were working the crowd outside saying, if you don't go along with us to crucify Jesus, you won't be able to come into the temple anymore. And the temple was a way of life for the Jewish people. So Peter is reminding them, Pilate tried to release him and you rejected 
this holy, righteous one and instead demanded the release of a murderer. They wanted Barabbas, a thief and a murderer, to be released to them. Because Jesus was the focus of discussion at that time, Peter is bringing Jesus up as the focus of discussion again this time, reminding them what they did. Then he said, but God, after you killed the author of life, because Jesus is the one that created all life, because you killed the author of life, God raised him back up again and gave him life again. We all witnessed this happening. The Sadducees and the Pharisees witnessed this. The Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection. They had their own ideas, and the Sadducees were very important men in the Jewish culture. They were the leaders in the Jewish church. The Pharisees that were the priests underneath them, they believed in the resurrection, and they believed in miracles, but the Sadducees did not. They were very legalistic, like a lot of people are that believe in scientific knowledge today. Uh, the Sadducees were the main ones that wanted Jesus crucified. A lot of the Pharisees were actually secret followers of Jesus. Some of the Sadducees were also, actually. So Peter goes on to say, through faith, in the name of Jesus, this man was healed. Remember last week, I, I explained to you, this man didn't have faith in the name of Jesus, but Peter did. Peter was sold down to his toenails, and that's a, a phrase I use here in Texas that means completely. Everything in his body, mind, and spirit was sold out that Jesus was the Messiah. And now the Holy Spirit that reminds us of everything Jesus did was totally in Peter, giving him the words to say at just the right time. Through faith in the name of Jesus, this man was healed. Peter had said, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, stand up and walk. All of chapter three, four, and five pivots around the healing of this lame man. So we're gonna come back to it over and over again. You know how crippled he was before. You saw him for 40 years begging for money, begging for alms at the gate beautiful. But faith in Jesus' name has healed him before your very eyes. He's speaking to the people that had seen the healing. And now all these other people are rushing out to see what all the commotion was. The people that were inside the, te the, inside the temple for, that had come for the three o'clock prayers. And he says, friends, I realize that what you and your leaders did to Jesus was done in ignorance. You were just doing what your leaders were telling you to do. So you're forgiven of that. God's given you a pardon for that. When God pardons somebody for something, it's like when we go on our computers and press the delete button. It totally takes it away. You see, back at this time, also, when scribes would write on parchment paper, the ink they used did not have acid in it, and so it did not penetrate the parchment paper. The ink we use today has acid in it, and it penetrates the paper. So if you write in ink on a piece of paper, you've got to use whiteout or something. It's not going to erase. And sometimes even writing in pencils, it doesn't erase because you've pressed so hard on the type of soft paper we use today. But papyrus was a harder paper, and this ink, if you made a mistake, all you had to do was take a damp cloth and blot out the mistake, just wipe off the words from the page of papyrus. It didn't stay on there. That's what happens when God forgives us of our sins. They're totally wiped away. And if it hadn't been for Jesus paying for our sins, when we ask for forgiveness, they would still be on there, just like the ink that we use today. We could cover them up, but they wouldn't be totally gone. So Peter says, through faith in the name of Jesus, this man was healed. And you know how crippled he was before. Faith in the name of Jesus has healed him before your very eyes. But friends, I want you to realize that what you and your 
leaders did to Jesus was done in ignorance. God was fulfilling what all the prophets had foretold about the Messiah, that he had to suffer these kind of things on the cross. The prophets were like grandfathers, teaching the children the oral traditions, telling them the truth. But the prophets had told the truth before it even happened. The grandfathers were reminding them of the truth. So I'm gonna get this umbrella again because the sun is really bothering my eyes. And I, I feel that that's what I'm supposed to do. So I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna get a little help from this umbrella to shield me from the sun. So I won't have to be bothered by it. Anytime something's bothering you, if you ask the Holy Spirit to help you, he can and he will, but you have to ask him first. So that suffering Messiah thing was where I left off on. Mark 15, 32 and Matthew 27, 40 reminds us in the New Testament that the prophets told us that the Messiah was gonna have to suffer. God spoke through the prophets. When the prophets spoke, it was God speaking himself. And he tried to let the Jewish people know this Messiah that's going to come is going to suffer. But the Jewish people had a really hard time accepting that because they had been taught by oral tradition and the Talmud that when the Messiah came, he was going to deliver them from all their oppression, the Roman oppression. They were just thinking at their present day oppression. But Jesus was coming to deliver us from the oppression that the enemy gives us, that Satan gives us, whenever we do something wrong, because he's always pointing the finger at us, saying, you did this, you did this. And going before the Lord and saying, they did this. That gives me permission to be able to mess with them in their lives, right? But when you ask God to forgive you of your sins, and he deletes, 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 and blots out, and Satan comes before saying, he did this. God goes, nope. Jesus told me that they asked for forgiveness, so I don't even know what you're talking about. You don't have permission to go mess with them about that. There might be consequences for whatever you did wrong, because remember, to sin means to miss the mark. It's an archery term. When an archer shoots an arrow, if it doesn't hit the bull, it's bullseye, it's called a sin. It's a mistake. But it can be wiped out. It can be deleted if you ask for forgiveness in God's kingdom. And God's the one that you have to stand before on judgment day. You might have to stand before a court of law if you rob a bank. And you might go to jail for it. That's your consequence. But God doesn't hold it against you any longer after you've asked for forgiveness. You are truly forgiven. So Peter says... The Messiah had to suffer these things. Now, repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Their sin was wanting the Messiah that God sent to be killed. And that's the sin that Peter's talking about. You need to repent about that. Even though God purposed in his plan for Jesus to suffer on this cross, your hearts were there wanting harm to come from him, for him, to him. And that's what you have to repent out of. So, he says, after you repent, times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord. And he will refresh you when you get unforgiveness and anger out of your heart. You don't have that burden anymore. And you are refreshed by the Holy Spirit because he restores your righteousness. And that's a very good place to be, restored. Relationships can be restored when the two people lay down their argument with each other and let God heal their hearts. But you have to remove Using the name of Jesus, you have to tell that anger and forgiveness to go. Remember, we talked about that with the splinter last week. So, if you do this, 
God will send the Lord to you again at just the right time, for he is your appointed Messiah. But for right now, he is in heaven with God the Father, waiting until God the Father sends him back to rapture the church. And that's when he harvests in all those that are believers so that they don't have to feel the wrath of, wrath of God during that seven years of tribulation, remember? So for he must remain in heaven until the time for final restoration of all things, as God promised long ago through his holy prophets. Remember, the prophet that you study, that you love, your forefather Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your own people. And Jesus was raised up from the Hebrew people. He was Jewish. Even Moses spoke about this. And Peter is trying to redirect them to the truth of what Moses said because their oral tradition in the Talmud, in the Mishnah, and then their oral tradition of commentaries had tweaked it and changed it to this Messiah that was going to deliver them in their present time, be a conquering king. He is our king, but he conquers over Satan, a much greater foe than the Romans. So this... this um, quote that Jesus, that Peter is giving is from Deuteronomy 18. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You should listen carefully to everything he tells you. They didn't when he tried to correct them. Then Moses said, anyone who will not listen to that prophet will be completely cut off from God's people. And these Sadducees and Pharisees and non-believers that were Jewish were going to be cut off from God's people just because they were in a national lineage. A chosen people didn't give them an usher in to heaven, a shoe in to heaven. Starting with Samuel, every prophet spoke about what is happening today. I don't know if you've got grandmothers and grandfathers that try to explain to you what's going on in the present day to remind you God said these things were going to happen. I didn't have but one grandmother when I was born and I was only able to see her three times. So I didn't have their wisdom speaking into my life. But the prophets were speaking wisdom into these Jewish people's lives. They studied it. They, they had the privilege of studying the word of God and having the prophets speak to them, a privilege that other nations did not have. And when you have a national privilege, you have a spiritual responsibility to make sure that what you're speaking of and what you're teaching is the truth. And these Jewish leaders, the Sadducees and Pharisees, were just making money off the people. They weren't speaking the truth. Peter is reminding them, you are the children of those prophets and you are included in the covenant promise that God made to your ancestors. For God said to Abraham, through your descendants, all the families on earth will be blessed. The Messiah was to bless all people on earth because he was going to pay for their sins. When God raised up his servant, Jesus, he sent him first to you the people of Israel, you had that privilege of being first. He wanted to bless you by turning each of you back from your sinful ways. But they didn't listen. And the Sadducees and the Pharisees that were non-believers that had come out from the worship center and heard what Peter was saying, Cut him off. Didn't let him even finish what he was preaching to the people. And we're going to find out next week what they did to Peter and John. You're going to have to tune back in to find out. Or even better yet, you can read Acts chapter 4 and find out ahead of time. I love you very much. We're going to end for today. Now I want to remind you, stay under the covering of the umbrella of the Holy Spirit. Let him shield you and protect you from things that would be bothering you or getting in your way. Or let him help you to remove the things by using the name of Jesus, the same name that Peter used.
to heal this man. I'll see you next week in the garden.